All righty. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chrissy Houlihan. Uh, I represent us in Congress for the 6th Congressional District, which is showing up here on the screen. The district is the entirety of Chester County and the lower southern portion of Berks County, which is inclusive of the city of Reading, uh, relevant to our conversation today. Uh, today we're going to discuss about um, the need for uh, another bipartisan stimulus package, uh, largely, and answer some questions regarding the economy at large. On May 15th, 15th, which is nearly three months ago, I and the Congress helped pass the HEROES Act through the House of Representatives. And this bill uh, included a wide range of priorities that are important to uh, our community here in the 6th and also several bills that I was very help, uh, proud to help lead. I led the effort to ensure that the 50,000 seniors who are on Medicare Advantage in Chester and Berks counties wouldn't continue to see higher costs due to COVID-19. And I helped craft amendments to the Defense Production Act after hearing from members in our community that shipments of PPE had been diverted by the federal government at the last minute. And I ensured that this bill includes a requirement for the federal government to notify and work with the state and local governments to replace any shipment of critical medical supplies that have been diverted. This bill also includes $500 billion for state and $375 billion for local governments to help replace the lost revenue and make them whole for money spent on COVID-19 response. This has been a major priority for Governor Wolf and for the leadership of both Chester and Berks counties as well. The small business section in this bill, the HEROES Act, contains many items that I also advocated for after hearing from our small business owners in our community. A carve out for micro businesses, greater flexibility for PPP forgiveness, and better transparency on reporting. The bill requires the CDC to develop a comprehensive national strategy to provide diagnostic and serologic testing, contact tracing, and recovery. This will better enable our communities to safely reopen and to get back to work without risking another wave of infections. I am not certain why the administration is at this point uh, stalled and refusing to put together such a testing strategy. We are seeing cases spike in new locations across the country. And as of today, it's estimated to, that we have lost at least 160,000 American lives to the virus, if not more. So beyond those aforementioned elements, this legislation includes funding for hazard pay and childcare for our frontline workers, an expansion of high-speed internet to help our families who are working from home and studying virtually, to assist our dairy and specialty crop producers who are struggling, and funding for safe and secure elections, and also uh, relevant to today's news cycle, supporting the US Postal Service, and there's just so much more in the HEROES Act. Fast forward to three months ago, and we seem to be at an impasse. The Senate has not passed a bill. The administration seems to be abandoning all attempts at ne negotiation. And the Senate and the president, in my opinion, are very much abdicating their responsibility to the American people during this incredibly important time of crisis. So I very much wanted to have this conversation today with experts like my amazing panel to further impress upon our community and the country at large why we desperately need another stimulus package. Before I introduce my panel, I've had the opportunity to talk to many, many of the secretaries of treasury who were responsible and on call, on call and on watch during the 2007 and 2008 crisis. And one of the uh, lessons that they passed along to me that has really resonated with me is that you just plain can't kind of look back on a crisis like this and ever regret not doing enough. So during uh, joining me today are my amazing panelists, Mr. Mark Zandi, who's our chief economist at Moody's and a resident of the 6th Congressional District, Marion Moskowitz, who is our Chester County Commissioner, and James Logan, the acting assistant manager of the city of Coatesville. And I'm very, very grateful to have you all here today. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to move on to the part of our um, of our program that is questions um, and each one of these questions has been uh, written and designed for um, it's in some cases one and in, in some cases many of our panelists, so, but I would like to make this an open and free flowing conversation. And so my first question is for Mr. Zandi, Mark Zandi, to ask, maybe if you could help us uh, understand what your current view of the economy is as of today, which is August 13th. And what are you seeing at the macro broader level of our economy right now? 
Well, thank you, Congresswoman. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in uh, today's event. Um, I appreciate that. And I uh, want to thank you for all the great work you're doing for, uh, for Chester County. I am a, a resident of Chester County, a long-standing resident, and uh, I really appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, by, my, by the way, my wife's right here, and she, she's a big fan. So <laughs> Say hi to her. I'll let me. you know that she's a big fan. I, I can't get away without saying that. <laughs> Uh, and actually, she's key to the election, you know, uh, coming up, right? So uh, absolutely, the old suburban housewife. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, uh, so the economy—it's struggling. Uh, it uh, just to give you a sense of of it, uh, uh, you can look at it through the, the prism of the job market. Uh, we're uh, in the worst of it. Back in April, we were down 22 million jobs. The unemployment rate. Uh, appropriately measured was touching 20%, 20%. We've made some progress since then uh, as businesses have uh, reopened in much of the country, but we, we still, a lot of stress. The, we're still down 13 million jobs. We got 9 million of the 22 million we lost back. So we're down 13 million jobs. And the unemployment rate is um, still well over 10%, appropriately measured, it's now 11%. And that doesn't include all the folks that uh, have left the labor force so discouraged, uh, not even looking for work and not count as unemployed. If you consider those folks, the unemployment rate would be closer to 14%. You know, this is cataclysmic. Just for context, in the worst of the financial crisis, uh, a little over a decade ago, in one month, uh, I think it was October of 09, we hit 10% for one month. And here we are, you know, firmly over, uh, firmly over that in, du in double digits. So we're, you know, we were, uh, shoved into a deep dark hole we're we're digging out uh, but we got a long way to go and if we, if we want to get out of this hole anytime in the foreseeable future we're going to need help from lawmakers like you and the administration to get it together and provide more support like the heroes act that you mentioned that would be very helpful in helping us to get out if we don't get support uh, i fear we're going back into recession instead of uh, regaining jobs and bringing down unemployment going to go in the other direction. We're going to lose more jobs and unemployment is going to, going to rise. And this period that we're in will not go, will go down not as simply being a just a really bad recession, but it'll go down, I think, in, in history as an ec another economic depression. So it's really critical uh, that, uh, that lawmakers uh, get it together in the next few days, next few weeks, and, and pass a piece of legislation to help support this economy. Before we leave that, can you talk a little bit about the connection or, or lack of connection with the progress of the stock market versus the economy at large, uh, if you're able to help us with that? Yeah, the market, stock market, as you know, has made its way back. It's now uh, close to where it was uh, right before the pandemic hit. Uh, so, you know, we went down, hit bottom in March, the Fed lowered interest rates, Congress and you and the administration came together passed three different rounds of fiscal support that helped. And now we've dug our way out and we're back to where we were. Uh, you know, that might seem a little surprising given the, the, the nature the state of the economy. And I think it goes, uh, you know, the economy is still struggling and we're, uh, we still have double digital unemployment. So how is it that the stock market has made its way back? Uh, a number of reasons I'll mention two very quickly. The first is the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve has been very aggressive in responding to the crisis, they did lower interest rates to zero and uh, Chair Powell, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve is telling all of us as, as plainly as he can that interest rates are gonna remain zero for a long time, two, three years. And if that's the case, that's kind of a green light to investors to buy, buy stocks. The other factor to mention is that uh, the market is increasingly a market for winners, not a market for the broader economy. I mean, you can look at the tech stocks, you know, five names, and, and you know the names, we all know the names. Five companies now account for 25% of all of the value of stocks. And that, that's the highest that's ever been since a brief uh, period in the 1960s. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how concentrated the market is and how unrepresentative it is of the broader economy. We've got hundreds of thousands, millions of smaller businesses, obviously not traded in the stock market that are really struggling here. Many of them are now failing, uh, need more support. And, and if they don't get it, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to go out of business and take a lot of jobs with them. So the stock market is, uh, is uh, increasingly disconnected from 
uh, what is going on in the broader economy. That's interesting, and, and thank you for that. And, and briefly from um, Mary and Commissioner Moskowitz and from James, if you could let us know what we're seeing here in Chester and, and Berks counties as well in terms of how does the economy look for us so far? Mary, let's start with you if that's okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for all the great work you're doing. We really need an advocate like you. We're so lucky to have you. And uh, Mark Zandi is awesome. And it's great to have you in our district as well as James and all the great work. So thank you all. We, we all have to work together in this process. And I think that's really happening on the ground. Um, you know, I, the shame of it is that those that were struggling are just struggling beyond belief right now. Uh, with the end of that extra money for unemployment, they're, they're getting very nervous and scared. There's a lot of health and human service needs out there, depression. We're dealing with a lot of anxiety, uh, more than we ever have before. I think the economy here, uh, our unemployment as of July 31st, I think was around 10% in Chester County, which is high for us. We were around four for a long time. And it's really our mom and pop um, businesses uh, that, that just have anywhere from two to 10 to 20 employees that make up a large portion of our great economy as well as our agricultural community. So we're still seeing a lot of strugglers. We have so much that we need to do to help them. And we cannot do it without the HEROES Act. Yeah, we thank that you. Desperately. Thanks, Mary. And I, um, I had the opportunity about once a week to volunteer at a food bank uh, just down the road from me. And, you know, more than 100 people access that food bank in the couple hours that they're open. And I live in a, a relatively well off portion of our county. And it is astounding to see that. And what's really depressing is many times I see people coming with families and also in scrubs, you know, so they're first responders who are accessing the food resources of the food bank. James, do you have something quickly that we could add to that in terms of your perspective from where you sit in the county? Um. Yeah, just uh, in, in terms of you know the view of the current economy, you know, as uh, as the commissioner mentioned, it, the ripple effect has just been massive. I mean, when you look at uh, individuals, for example, in the city of Coatesville, that are those um, you know we we think they're essential employees, the ones that are working retail in our Wawa's grocery stores, uh, low wage earners, if you will, they need this economy to be strong in order for them to provide, you know, food on their tables for their families. And, and right now, because of the current situation, uh, it is having such a tremendous ripple effect on everyone. Um, so, you know, it, it's, I, I think everyone is, uh, you know, working very hard to, to try to figure out what is the best strategy to take uh, to kind of, uh, you know, stop the bleeding, if you will. Mm -hmm. And for all intents and purposes, uh, the efforts are good um, but it's just, it's, it's just very hard to kind of figure out what to handle first. And uh, because they all have a ripple effect, everyone's going to be affected by it. So let's talk about that with the next question. And I'll start with Mr. Zandi on this, which is um, that the HEROES Act at a macro level, at a nationwide level, is a $3 trillion bill. Um, what would be the consequences, the ripple effects, so to speak, at the national level and then at the uh, countywide level for Marion and then at the local level for James? If we didn't pass something like this, what kind of uh, costs uh, on our society, both uh, financial and, and uh, intangible, would there uh, perhaps be? And let's start with Mark with that. Sure. So the HEROES Act, the piece of legislation that the Democratic Congress passed, I guess, a couple months ago now. Uh, right, yeah. Yeah, a long time ago, uh, would be very beneficial to the economy. Uh, would get us back to something closer to full employment a lot faster. Um, again, the unemployment rate today is about 11 percent. Full, full employment is something south of five, probably closer to four percent. And the HEROES Act would get us there uh, much more quickly, uh, probably a lot obviously depends on the pandemic and how that plays out, but under reasonable assumptions, we'll get us back to full employment, you know, sometime early 2022, mid 2022, something like that. Uh, to bookend things, if we, if uh, Congress and administration don't come together and pass a piece of legislation, there's no more support. So let's say this is the, we, we got what we're gonna get and, and no more is coming. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think we're going 
back into recession. We're going to go back down into the hole. That means unemployment, we're going to lose jobs. And this, this time, the job loss is going to be much broader based. I mean, so far, the job loss has been in industries that have been hit by the pandemic, you know, the obvious ones, retailing, leisure hospitality, accommodation, transportation, you know, those kinds of industries. But it'll be broader than that. We'll, we'll, every industry will be affected and we'll see job losses across the board and unemployment will, will rise. So we're already in double digits. We're going to go further into double digits. And as I think I mentioned earlier, I think uh, that means this period will go down as, uh, as a depression, you know, something that is just, we haven't seen something like that this since the, since the 1930s. And, you know, the, the, uh, what you observed uh, with hundreds of people trying to get assistance, uh, you know, that just think about what that will look like in that kind of an economy. So we really don't want to go down that path. Uh, ho hopefully the, the economic logic I just laid out is compelling enough for, uh, to put enough pressure on, on lawmakers to get it done. So, but if we don't get it done, then uh, it's going to be a very, very difficult time dead ahead. Thank you, Mark. And, and Marion, you mentioned a little bit about some of the other consequences in terms of mental health and that sort of thing. But what uh, what sort of industries may be impacted in Chester County? Um, what kinds of jobs are you seeing um, affected uh, if we didn't have a stimulus that would uh, take care of our local and state municipalities? As an example, what would be the implications as well for uh, with a lack of action on the part of Congress and the administration? Yeah, so um, in Chester County specifically, we have a large agricultural community that is already struggling and feeling this enormous weight. Not only do we have the larger picture of that, but we also have the workers there. And um, that is already an issue. They're living in um, difficult circumstances as it stands. They need food support, they need medical support. If they lose those jobs, that will create a much bigger hole all the way around, especially in the community. But I see, I'm, I'm concerned about the homeless rate increasing. People will not be able to pay their bills. I'm concerned about that creating a COVID increase. And then we have additional health care. I see our restaurants that are struggling as it is, our hotels, our accommodations and uh, retail. If without support, the economic engine for this county will dry up and it's going to put the pressure on the county and the county's going to end up having to raise taxes and nobody can afford that. So it's just uh, the economic impact is going to be devastating and we're going to be in this for a, a while. We need to have funds to carry us through. Yeah, I think we're going to be in this for a while, even if we do kind of all the right things. Um, and last, uh, James, can you give us some insight in terms of kind of if we don't have a next round of stimulus, what do you foresee happening in your community? Um, well, uh, personally, I, I think, you know, you're going to lose a lot of uh, you know, confidence. And, and what I mean by that is you're going to lose confidence uh, in the industry, employers, uh, because right now, uh, you know, there are individuals that are not at work. And, and the companies, small companies, um, are looking at, well, do I need to have, you know, five or six employees? Maybe I can make it with three or, or two employees. So that also is a factor. And, and then what do you do? What happens to those employees that used to work at that particular business? So, um, you know, I, I think what's going to, what's eroding fast these days is the, uh, is the confidence of the employer. Um, uh, and, and he or she, you know, is really struggling whether to bring back, you know, their, their good employees. And I think that's going to hurt. And then on the flip side of that, uh, you know, the, the individuals themselves, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, what's the alternative for them? Um, you know, there are individuals right now that um, are really looking, you know, what is my next move? And, and they don't know what that next move is going to be. Uh, even though we see job postings, um, you know, some of those jobs are, are great jobs, but you may need transportation to get there. Uh, some of folks don't have transportation, or you mm -hmm. may have to work from home. Some people don't have the resources to work from home. So uh, this, this is a very, um, uh, it's a disturbing, you know, kind of situation to be in. It goes beyond, you know, just the term of recession. I mean, it's something that, um, I mean, it's so devastating, but I'm an optimist. And I, I think that, 
you know, we, we have, you know, great leaders in this community and this county. Uh, I do believe that, you know, we can start, you know, putting our, our minds together and thinking um, of programs and ways to kind of not so much eliminate what's going on, but to, to maybe manage it a little bit better and, and, and get ourselves in a situation of recovery. And, um, and some, yeah. of that re some of that recovery may take, um, may take on some risk. And, and I think that's gonna, and that's another discussion, you know, what does that risk factor look like? And in a lot of ways, I think in, that we have uh, is as horrifying as this pandemic is and as our response has, has been, we have a real opportunity, I think, to rebuild in a different way and to innovate and to use, as you mentioned, things like infrastructure and access to a broadband and those kinds of things that we've always known have been important uh, to understand now why they have been so important in terms of, as Mary mentioned, our agriculture in industry and making sure that that industry is as modernized as possible in terms of access to jobs, as you indicated, James, from home so that people have broadband from their home. Uh, education equity, um, 5G and broadband in general is something that we now really understand why people have been talking about this as an issue and we have an opportunity in our in our packages, in our COVID relief packages to help in the, that inequity amongst other things. Um, my next question is for both Marion and James, which is a lot of the stimulus packages that have existed so far and the one particularly the HEROES Act that is in existence right now um, really helps state and local municipalities and their governments um, that have put out a lot of resources to be able to combat COVID uh, and be able to make them more financially solvent. I know, Marianne, you and I have had conversations about the fact that Chester County was actually quite well financially situated for COVID, a uh, COVID crisis. We had a rainy day fund and thankfully we will, were able, in addition to having our own um, healthcare um, system, we were able to use the resources in our rainy day fund to to respond by getting PPE and by getting tests that other um, parts of our state and our nation weren't able to do as well. But now those resources are depleted because of that. Uh, can you guys both talk a little bit about what those resources or lack thereof are no longer allowing us to purchase or buy or the security that uh, is um, at risk because we are uh, have depleted those resources? Sure, I mean, we went out very early on. We were very lucky as, um, as the Congresswoman stated, and we bought uh, test kits. Uh, we had antibody tests, we had PCR tests. We got them so early and PPEs that we were able to give them to our businesses, our emergency responders, our healthcare workers right off the bat. But those tests and those uh, PCR tests, they're, they're gonna run out and we really need to keep testing. We cannot stop testing. We have to keep testing to get people back to work for those jobs that are available. So that's one of the things that's going to be a continual issue, as well as possibly uh, looking into creating your own lab to get these test results back quicker, because that has become a nightmare. Um, you know, we, we are giving grants to our small businesses, but there are so many needs that we need the funds to help keep them going until they can fully recover. So there's just, there's not enough money. There needs to be more. And I think sometimes that the federal government, um, our administration just forgets what the average person is going through and how their communities mean the world to them and, and our seniors and the, and the health needs of them and what we provide. There's so much out there that we can be doing to help our community. Thanks, Marianne. And James, do you have any reflections on kind of what it is that uh, maybe lack of revenue in your particular part of our community is, is causing in, in terms of uh, implications for the short and long terms? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the, I mean, just looking at how the local governments leverage, you know, funding or aid. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I think we have to do is uh, we're getting, you know, funding from local government. Or excuse me, government. Uh, uh, we have to identify partners. Uh, some municipalities, some cities throughout the country, they're doing a great job with partnering with corporations, and and that particular aid or funding um, pool becomes greater. Um, so I, I think we have to get better at that. We have to to partner with you know corporations and other partners 
that can help leverage that aid and and then identify in, in areas like let's say code still you know the number of businesses we have you know what type of uh, assistance they need and and then you know pretty much um, you know implement or deliver the, the assistance that we can and I know it takes a long time to do that I mean you know we have so many businesses here in Chester County and in, in the city of Coastal as well and and I know it's it's probably you know you, you probably have to be a mathematician to figure out how do you systematically address everyone's needs but I, I think we have to to make sure that we have that aid there to support them um, I mean one of the things that we're doing as a municipality we you know we're shopping different places to find you know hand sanitizing gloves and, and other PPE we, we do get some from the county but um, as Commissioner mentioned I mean the resources are, are getting very low and and folks have to kind of fend for themselves so so the, the partnerships are incredibly important uh, with corporations with, with other stakeholders uh, to to kind of fill the gaps that, uh, that we're experiencing yeah, and one of the things that, that really struck me while I was putting together, while we were putting together the HEROES Act was the timing of all this. A lot of state and local governments are in the process or may have already gone through the process of their budget uh, for the next year. And if they um, can't anticipate or count, count on revenue um, that they normally would expect or can't anticipate and can't count on help or aid that's coming from the federal government, that ends up with very, very difficult decisions that have to be made some, sometimes in terms of staff and personnel and, you know, first responders as an example uh, and unfortunately with months that have gone by with uncertainty you know this uh, has not provided clarity for our governments our state and local governments so they are in an even worse position uh, and before we move on Mark do you have anything to add to the kind of concept of uh, the aspect that seems to be really contentious um, uh, which is really interesting about the HEROES Act there seems to be so much contention about the fact that we are providing for state and local government. When I've had both Commissioner Moskowitz, as well as the commissioners of Berks County, all of them asking for support, uh, one Republican controlled in Berks and one in democratically controlled in, in, in uh, Chester County. Can you comment a little bit about the, that, um, that aspect? Yeah, it's a bit perplexing why there isn't broader support for more help to state and local governments. Uh, there is no more effective way to help the economy during a downturn than providing that support. Because, you know, you, 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 the state and local governments, they don't, they can't go out and borrow money. They got to balance their budget. So if they don't, if they uh, have shortfalls in revenue and increasing in, in spending on Medicaid and other things, they're just going to have less dollars to spend on everything else. And it's going to be a direct hit to the economy. Just, just to give you a number, on jobs, uh, state and local governments have laid off 1.3 million people already, you know, since March. So that gives you a sense of the magnitude of the problem here. Uh, and if you give a dollar to, if the federal government gives a dollar to a state or a local government, that goes right into the economy. You know, it helps pay for the wages of, uh, of, of teachers and fire, police, emergency responders. And by the way, these are middle paying jobs, right? The typical wage for a state and local government worker nationwide is $65,000. So that's right in the middle. This is middle America that we're talking about. And we need those, we need those folks at any time, but cl uh, clearly in a, in, a, in a pandemic, in a crisis, we depend on them even more and we, we need those workers. Or that, you know, that dollar goes to uh, programs that are helpful, the supportive of uh, people who are under a lot of stress, unemployment insurance or uh, food assistance or rental assistance, you know, so that they don't become homeless, uh, goes immediately into the economy. And, and you know, we, we have a lot of experience with this. I mean, this is tried and true uh, support that we provide in every recession. So go back to the financial crisis. This is providing federal government, providing money to state and local governments to kind of navigate through was a big part of that. And there's a lot of academic research that shows that that was incredibly effective. So it's very uh, perplexing. The, the final thing I'll say is, you know, this isn't a problem just for, you know, Chester County or Northeastern United States. This is a, a problem that every community from uh, coast to coast, whether they be R or D or whatever, they, they got a problem and, you know, they're grappling with this. And so this is, uh, you know, it seems obvious of all the things we should be doing uh, in support we should be providing. First is unemployment insurance, food assistance, keeping people from getting homeless. But right underneath that and directly related to that is 
providing that help to state and local governments could, so they can provide the critical services that they, that they provide. Yeah, I had the opportunity to listen in on a conversation with the mayor of Houston, uh, and of course a d different state uh, than, uh, than our own, but many of the same struggles and problems with uncertainty about when he would be receiving help, if he would be receiving further help, and um, the kind of contortions that he needed to go through. As you've been talking, James, about working with private, you know, uh, organizations to try to help in the interim, uh, I just I don't understand why we're doing that to our mayors of all different kinds and sizes. Um, the next question is for Mark, and it's a little bit of a wonky question, which is that given that the cost of a ten-year Treasury note is around a half of a percent right now. Do you think that the concerns of the cost of an emergency stimulus package are appropriate or are they misplaced? Well, uh, I don't think we have any choice but to, and by the way, I like wonky questions, so keep them coming, that's okay. Um, uh, I don't think we have a choice uh, but to continue to uh, borrow money, run deficits and, and, and uh, increase debt to support the economy in a crisis like this, because if we don't, uh, the economy will evaporate. Uh, we'll lose many, many more jobs. Unemployment will be much higher. Uh, the cost to the government even greater from lost revenue. The, our fiscal situation would, would be even worse. You know, it's a, it's a Hobson's choice. We, you know, there's no good choice. We are taking the least bad choice. Uh, so uh, in this current environment, particularly as you point out, when interest rates are as low as they are and likely to stay low uh, for a very long time, it, 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 it's, it makes perfect sense to use, all the, to use our resources to try to keep the economy together as best as we can keep it together to get to the other side of this pandemic. Now, now having said that, uh, I do think on the other side of the pandemic, when the economy is back to full employment, you know, when we have a four, four and a half percent unemployment rate, and wages are back and people are working and, and the economy's humming, we do need to focus on addressing our fiscal problems and think about returning to fiscal discipline. Uh, and, and by the way, we, did, we didn't do that, you know, uh, in the last business cycle. I mean, we use fiscal policy to help get through the financial crisis, but then we got to the good part of the economy and then uh, we got these tax cuts to particularly large companies like Moody's, whom I work for, and for uh, wealthy individuals and high income households. And we exacerbated, we made worse the, our financial problems. So at the, same, at the exact right time, we should have been working on reducing our deficits and debt and getting back to balance. We did the exact opposite thing, the wrong thing. But hopefully on the other side of this, we do the right thing and we start focusing on, on getting our fiscal house in order. But you know, this is not, you know, when you're in a crisis, when you have 10% plus unemployment, when you're at risk of going into depression, if you don't act, you don't act quickly, we're gonna be in a much worse economy and a much worse fiscal situation. We have no choice. Thanks, um, and a, a little bit of less of a wonky, but still, still wonky question for you is, um, recently the president signed an executive order effectively suspending payroll taxes for a, a point of time, which uh, has historically been um, helpful in social security funding as well as Medicare funding. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, how is that? Can that be executed? How can that be executed? And I'll start with you, uh, Mark, but then I would like to know kind of what the implications are downstream or if you've heard any of those, uh, Marion and James. Well, you know, the president signed four executive orders on Saturday, last Saturday. This was one of them. They're all collectively much ado about nothing. Uh, this, this particular one on the payroll tax is, you know, forget about the legality of it. Uh, you know, that's a question, but just the practicality of it you know, the only way that gets implemented is if employers change withholding for their employees. But I can't imagine, I, you know, I can't imagine I would do that. I mean, because I know, you know, at the beginning of next year, I'm going to have to change withholding back. And then my employees are going to have to pay even more because they're going to have to make up for the, the taxes they didn't pay between now and the end of the year. You know, effectively, what the president is proposing is giving people a zero interest rate loan for four months. Like, you know, and, and by the way- That they'll have to pay back, right? Yeah, that they got to pay back. I mean, it's, it's a loan, it's not a grant. I mean, you're not getting, you're not getting the money, you're, you're just getting a, a loan. And, you know, of all the things one would do, why would you do that? I mean, this is a, a, a gift to, this is, this is trying to help people who are already employed. I mean, if we have limited resources, we got to be helping the people who are unemployed, you know, get 
give them that, you know, extra unemployment insurance or another stimulus check, you know, you know, something like that. But, uh, you know, uh, provide, and then the other thing is, even if employers changed withholding and people got that money, how many people would actually spend it? Because they know come January and February, they got to give it all back. So it's not a, a very effective way to help. And then as you point out, you know, that money, that payroll tax money is earmarked for Social Security, Medicare, the, uh, you know, the things that our seniors rely on. And, uh, you know, th does that make any sense? I mean, you know, uh, we're going to have to make up for that at some point down the road. So, you know, this, it, on every level, it's just hard to fathom, you know, why you would want to move forward with something like, like that. I mean, it's a good thing the president recognizes the economy's help. Uh, that's a good thing, uh, but that's not the kind of help that the economy needs. Yeah, and it's even more reason why it's really imperative that the Congress come back together, back to the table and, and get to business and get negotiating, because I don't think any of these um, executive orders are particularly efficacious or, or, or useful. And in many cases, they've just muddied the water um, and made it more confusing for business people and for people who are employed and, and not helpful, as you mentioned, for people who aren't employed. Uh, Marion and James, uh, first, I guess, James, because you're unmuted, do you have any further comment there before we go to our final Final uh, question? No, I, I think uh, Mark said that very uh, eloquently. Um, I, I would like to just make one additional comment about the local government. Uh, one of the things that I, I'm realizing about the, the local governments and the need for local governments, our municipalities, borough cities, is that uh, our residents want us to, to operate. They want us to, to be here for them. Um, when we talk about the, the limited funding and, and what's happening, what's crippling uh, local governments because of the budgets, uh, it, it's really unfortunate. Uh, and, and when you hear the community says, look, you know, we know things are tight, but they do understand the importance of having a local government in place to, to help manage the cities, to, to help them with quality of life issues. So, so for me, you know, it, it, it's very critical that we receive, you know, support from the federal uh, government, um, you know, to all municipalities and all cities throughout the country. Thanks, James. And Marian, how about you? Uh, I'm just hearing that businesses are just not willing to withhold that and uh, or not pay that. And, and it's confusing the employees. They really don't understand the implications of that. So to Mark's point, it's, it's just a zero sum game. There's just no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, the waters. <laughs> I, I think it is really confusing. And you know, with the last couple minutes that we have together, I don't have a final question. Is there anything that uh, I should have asked that we didn't cover? And I'll start uh, with Marion this time. I just want to mention very quickly because I know time's short that we have had a restore Chester, Chester County program. Uh, to help all of our industry sectors with the toolkit to make uh, their process of reopening and opening uh, safe and healthy and how we can help them. And we are available. We have hotline uh, all day long for businesses and the community. And now we are working on an economic recovery plan with those industry sectors uh, to see how we can be helpful, what they need, and how we're going to grow this economy and make it better than it was. Perfect. Thanks, Marian. Uh, and we'll make sure when we put this up to have that information for you on, on the website too. Uh, James, how about last comments? Um, well, first, I just want to thank you again for, uh, for allowing me to be part of this uh, wonderful panel. Um, and, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. I would just say that, again, you know, we, we all are in this together. We all are trying to put our heads together to, to come up with a solution that, that's going to be, you know, uh, effective for, for everyone, businesses, families, and our young people, and, uh, and 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 it is really important that we 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 work to to do something uh, in terms of um, you know providing resources for our young people because as they are as the parents are suffering and the businesses are suffering, um, so too are our young people. I mean, they're struggling being at home, uh, learning virtually, and unable to get outside. So, in, in all of our efforts, um, I would. Uh, want to make sure that we, we definitely keep our young people in mind to what we're doing. Yeah, and the HEROES Act, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't believe we touched a whole lot on that. Had uh, This is actually one place where um, we agree 
uh, administration, I, I think the Senate and, and the House, the importance of education and the importance of uh, making sure that we're taking care of kids and families uh, and providing resources for it. The HEROES Act did provide quite a lot of resources for um, school of any form, whether it was virtual or whether it was in person or hybrid. Um, and that I think is really the responsibility of our state and local governments to figure out what's the safest thing for us to do, but they definitely need resources to be able to do that. Uh, and that I think is a really good point that we forgot to talk about. And Mark, with your last comments, do, what, do you have anything that we forgot to talk about. Well, thank you, Congresswoman, for the opportunity. I'll end on a positive note. So, Yay. <laughs> <laughs> look, you know, I, and I'm going to butcher this, but you know, you'll get the sense of it. I mean, it, it goes to Winston Churchill. I have to bring up Winston Churchill. He said something about Americans that I think really resonates. He says, you know, Americans. And this, of course, he's this was back in World War II, and he's referring about uh, uh, his dealings with Franklin Roosevelt and you know, in Congress at the time. He said something to the effect, well, you know, Americans, they'll, they'll try anything and everything, and then they'll ultimately do the right thing. I'm pretty, <laughs> that's going to be the case here. We will ultimately do the right thing. It just, I wish we would do it sooner rather than later. That's a really good place to end on. Um, I'm enormously grateful to you guys for providing this conversation, this really insightful conversation. Um, we'll be putting up some resources as well on the website, but we do have a dedicated group focused particularly on small business, a uh, small business at mail.house.gov. If you guys have any questions on that, uh, I know that our community is under no enormous amounts of pressure and pain, uh, and we look forward to continuing to try to support people. Thank you very much again to our panelists and I believe that that is a wrap. And please, Mark, say hi to Ava for me. And Marion, I'll see you for our photo. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you.